My guest today is Professor Louise Wesling, who is Professor Emerita of English and Environmental Studies at the University of Oregon. Her research focuses on ecophenomenology and literature, animality and embodiment in language. A related activity is herding sheep with us today in Kelpies, <laughs> a good way to learn and develop cross-species communication. Welcome, Molly. Thank you. So as, as I mentioned, Molly, I, know I, I have no background in any of these, and I find it really fascinating. Um, I'm of the view that when you, when you don't know much, your chance of learning things are not high. <laughs> uh, and in highly specialized areas, people tend to form biases very quickly. And then you have strong biases, and I'm thinking about scientific and uh, social sciences disciplines. Uh, it's often difficult to see outside those um, outside those silos. So I always look forward to these types of conversations and I hope to learn something from this. So I want to start with one of your essays, Deep History at the Rhythm of Catastrophe. You say here a relatively brief geological time span of our species existence has been punctuated again and again by catastrophic events, volcanic eruptions, devastating climate changes, melting glaciers, and consequent rising seas. Humans have died in myriad of ways uh, during such events, but many have also survived and restored or reinvented their cultures. Yeah, this is sort of topical <laughs> in some sense. Well, actually, it was written for a blog at Cambridge University Press at the beginning of the pandemic. A and lot the of the authors for that press contributed entries to the blog, and that's what that was. Yeah, so we have had the pandemic, we have a war going on in Ukraine, and um, along with or prior to the pandemic, we had a cultural discontinuity in the US and you know some uh, modern democracies all around the world. So in, in some sense, we are going through uh, a phase of humanity uh, that could be quite similar to some of the things that you describe here. Mm -hmm. So, so, so what you, what is a general um, summary of this? That uh, Homo sapiens, um, I don't know, fifty thousand years out of African savanna, we had hominoids before that, maybe hundred thousand years. We had human-like um, species in in Europe before Homo sapiens came out of Africa. Um, and since then, last 50,000 years, they have gone through a lot, right? But they survived, is that the idea? Yes, but it's been a relatively stable period for geology and the climate. Um, it's the, called the Holocene, and it is uh, a period after the end of the last ice age and the glaciation of the Northern Hemisphere. And so we have lived in a kind of, some people call it Goldilocks world, where everything is relatively um, comfortable for our species. But that was not always the case in the history of the planet at all, and it's not going to be in the future either. Yeah, I, um, I, I do some work with physicists uh, as well, and um, we often don't see the, the things that fly past, <laughs> fly past the Earth, because NASA, it looks like they don't actually advertise. Uh, there's something that's going past, I think in, in six or seven days, that's quite big. <laughs> that asteroid, uh, that very large asteroid. A very yeah. large asteroid, yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, like you say, 50,000 years have been quite calm. Uh, and, a lot of the, lot of sort of the, the big discontinuities that we have seen, as you mentioned in the essay, are related to biological discontinuities, yeah. right? Uh, microbial attacks, and as you say here somewhere, I can quite remember you say, you know, sort of planned, planned attacks on humanity. Planned. Planned meaning, you know, sort of autocrats and you know those types oh, of yes. wars, yes. yeah. Human behavior, yes. Yeah. And, and, and so, so, so why do you think uh, humans survived? 
um, even though geologically we have been living in a calm time, we have had a lot of terrible issues to deal with, like oh, yeah. the last 50,000 years, right? Yes. Yes, there have been very serious volcanic eruptions, some of which changed the weather for as long as two or three years. One of the most famous was um, the year without a summer, about 1815. Um, now I can't think of the name of the volcano, but I believe it was in Indo Indonesia. Yeah. Someplace. Uh, and it there was so much ash in the atmosphere that the climate cooled radically for a few years, and there really was was very little harvest in either 1814 or 15 and uh there was famine in many parts of the world especially europe which we are more focused on but um that's one example that's fairly recent a little farther back about 7000 years ago there was a volcanic eruption south of us it was um mount mazama the top of it blew off and uh, it is now what's called Crater Lake. The, the caldera is the is very very deep, and it, it it's a tourist attraction. But the Klamath Indians from down at the border of California and Oregon have uh, a folk memory of this event, and they they have stories about how their ancestors took shelter in a lake some miles away in order to avoid being burned up by the ash that was falling from the sky and all of that sort of thing. So that that kind of thing happens. Um, as for your question about why we are still here, how we have survived, you know, Neanderthals lasted a lot longer, two or three hundred, mm -hmm. about three hundred thousand years, and they did not have the technologies we have. They had some of them, but they did not apparently have close fitting clothing. And they were cold adapted to a degree, but um, something happened around the time that our species, our form of modern humans encountered them in Europe that uh, caused them to go extinct. And nobody knows quite what it is. Mm -hmm. Some of it may have to do with a period of um, called the bowling alarod or something like that, where there were a, 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 there was an enormous covering of um, glacial ice over the sea that broke off from Greenland, and it influenced the climate of Europe so much that uh, it cooled everything down. Also, there was a, a volcano whose caldera is uh, in the Bay of Naples now that blew up about 37,000 years ago and caused uh, cooling and a lot of problems. So the Neanderthals didn't last, but we did. I'm sure there was a lot of damage to so-called fully modern Homo sapiens, us, but um, we had more close-fitting clothing and um, the ability. We just had a, a slightly more advanced technology at that point than the Neanderthals did, and that has continued to develop. Since then, we have managed to um, shelter ourselves from the surrounding world in very, very elaborate ways now. And we think we don't belong to that outside world anymore, but we're mistaken. And I think we're going, we're finding it out. People in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, are having a terrible time in India and Pakistan with the heat waves. Um, you can't build buildings to shelter everyone from that quickly, quickly as the climate warms. Yeah, I, I wondered, Molly, sometimes that um, whether it was just random luck. Um, I remember it was 15,000 years ago, approximately, that uh, Homo sapiens went through a bottleneck. Um, I, maybe I got the timing was wrong. Was it 15,000? I, I thought it was earlier, but it could so be. It was a bottleneck. It, yeah. yeah, it might be 50,000. 50,000, 50, 50, 50, 50, yeah. yeah. And my understanding is that there were only 15,000 samples in that bottleneck, 15,000 Homo sapiens samples left. Yeah. Uh, I've read the same thing, yes. And we grew from there to 8 billion now. Yes, yes. Uh, but we micro-segment ourselves into all sorts of things, countries, religion, skin color, yeah. states, yeah. language, country clubs, all sorts of things, right? Because mm -hmm. we have to. Um, 
So this general idea that Homo sapiens all share the same genes is an is a is potentially an uncomfortable topic <laughs> for most of the world. I think. I I think it should be comforting. I don't share the discomfort at all. I think there's too much emphasis on the differences and not enough on the commonalities. Because not that genes are the answer to everything. That is not, genes are, are inert. You know this probably better than I do. They don't do anything. It's the cell, the cytoplasm in the cell and the, the whole environment that is is stimulating the genetic uh, expression of things and it one gene can do several different things depending on the instructions it gets from the RNA and all kinds of other things. So anyway, uh, we may have all the same genes. Some of us have more Neanderthal remnants than others, but that doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't negate the differences of culture, but they're not insurpassable, insurmountable at all. Yeah, there is a hardware effect and a software effect, as you say. Um, so there, there was a program by National Geographic that if you send a saliva sample, the program has been uh, terminated by now. But I did, if you send a saliva sample, you know, they will show you uh, where the heat map is or, or where your ancestors came from. Oh, yes. Uh, and, you know, my family never left South India. I grew up there before I came to the U.S., but my heat map uh, shows um, hotspots in in Italy, in Spain, in Netherlands, <laughs> and, and elsewhere, uh, which is a fascinating thing uh, to, yeah. for people to really sort of internalize, right? I mean, but does that mean that some of your ancestors came from those places, or that some of them were part of groups that spread out to those places? India is a little bit of a complex story because yes. uh, there was a lot of European traffic. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. But in South India, yeah. uh, some of the older populations uh, yeah. are less mixed with the so-called Indo-European immigrants who came later. The Yamnaya people. Right. Yeah. yeah. So th th this uh, this study also shows you know American Indians um, essentially you know crossing the bridge. Uh, yes. from Asia to, to the Americas and going all the way to South America. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a general sense that, you know, it all started somewhere and we've been sort of migrating <laughs> all around well, That's the place. true. Yes, I'm sure we have. The ancient DNA studies by people like David Reich at Harvard and, and the Pabos lab in Germany um, sh have been able to establish that there have been many, many, many migrations. And it's quite interesting to see how busy our species has been in moving around. But before that, Homo erectus was in Indonesia as far back as 1.8 million years. So they were very active in moving too, and they were not modern humans. Yeah, there's, you know, once, once you can start to walk, you yeah. can keep on walking. <laughs> A lot and, of this uh, is connected to climate change though. Yeah. There were periods when it was possible to walk into uh, Arabia, which was covered with grasses and had plenty of water at that time. When they, some of these beings, these hominins moved out and spread. And other times they couldn't get out because it, it was uh, too dry. And they were following the, anim the other animals. They were part of these animal communities that moved. They weren't, it wasn't just people all by themselves heading out. It, it was a whole culture, in some sense, heading out. Um, you uh, you talk about a few of the sort of the the, the big um, issues that we ran across. So uh, I didn't know about this. The the, the Striga slides, you say, yeah. six thousand uh, uh, of the coast of Norway caused a mega tsunami that yeah. engulfed the marshy land bridge of Dogaland. So. Uh, so, so what what is what is that? What what is the slide you talked about? It was an underground, I mean, an underwater collapse of a shelf off the west coast of Norway, 
And there's a lot of debate about exactly how it happened and what it submerged. But before it even happened, um, the sea had been rising as the glaciation disappeared and, and more and more water came into the seas. And Doggerland, uh, for a time before the glaciers were all gone, there was no North Sea. There was no English Channel. It was all one continent. And people moved back and forth across what they call Doggerland now, that's now covered by the North Sea. But they can see forests under the water. The, uh, you know, marine archaeologists and people in the UK and in um, Scandinavia. Uh, what happened was a gradual rise of the sea that began to submerge that area. But the, the Strega slide did cause um, some kind of tsunami activity that has been they can find traces of it on the east coast of England and, and Scotland and uh, places like that. So they know that the water moved. Whether there were people who got swept away is unknown. There were there were nomadic peoples, you know, foraging and hunting peoples moving back and forth across that area for million for thousands of years. And they had begun to retreat because of the rising seas. The people who live in the Netherlands now are uh, the descendants of a lot of those people, and they know how to manage the water because they've been holding it back for quite a long time. Mm. Um, this happened gradually before and then suddenly because of the tsunami. And before too long, you couldn't walk from, you know, Brittany to Cornwall anymore or from Dover across to Kent. That's all I know about it. I mean, I'm not that kind of a scientist. You know, I'm treading... I'm trespassing in other people's <laughs> time. But we need to know these things, at least a little bit about them. We need to know these things. Uh, so in spite of the calm geological, macro geological yes. environment, we went through very, very micro uh, events that had a huge impact on many peoples. Yeah. Uh, and then you talk about sort of the biological uh, thing. So the bubonic uh, plague, killed 30 to 50 percent of the population of Europe in the 14th century. That's mind-boggling. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think it was that high. Well, there's debate about that too, but they it probably was at least 30 percent. Some people say up to 80, but I don't think that's widely agreed mm -hmm. upon. There's a wonderful new book out by a, a historian and classicist at uh, the University of Oklahoma named Kyle Harper called Plagues Upon the Earth, and he describes um, a deep history of disease for hum for Homo sapiens and talks about that particular uh, era. His his specialty before he wrote this book was, um, that was Greece and Rome, and there were bubonic plague uh, outbreaks in Rome during the time of Justinian, for instance, and there were plagues in Greece earlier, and then uh, the world of Constantinople went through a terrible siege of bubonic plague, Black Death also. So those kinds of things swept over. And in Shakespeare's time, the the theaters could not be open for as long as two years because of the plague. And so the players would travel around the rest of England giving the performances uh, in, in front of, um, you know, inns. In, in yards where there was a lot of fresh air out in the open during those periods when they couldn't be in London in close packed crowds. Yeah, so the um, the contemporary issue, the, the COVID-19 issue that we are going through, um, clearly from a, the denominator is quite big, <laughs> it got 8 billion people. Yes. So the percentage basis, it doesn't look too, too bad. Too bad. You know, we lost a million people in the U.S. They say the numbers are not very clear, 5 to 10 million in India, but then you're going to divide really? up 1.4 billion. It looks right. like a small, a small percentage, uh, but it's not over yet. Uh, it, oh, no. it's, a, yeah, it's an ongoing, ongoing issue. So... Um, but we survive. That's the theme of the essay, right? So 
in spite of all this really big discontinuities Homo sapiens went through, they seem to pick themselves up and continue. Um, and I wonder if it is a characteristic of the Homo sapien or it's just random luck. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think it's a characteristic of any species. It, it, it strives to continue. I mean, if I were a Native American, I would feel uh, very sad because most of my people were destroyed by disease and other things two, two or three hundred, four hundred years ago. This was a quite a well-populated continent before European contact and disease destroyed 80 percent of the population or, or more before the settlers started even moving west. So the fact that Native Americans are still here and still struggling uh, is testimony to the species will to continue. But at the same time, they have plenty of problems because of past and present oppression. And African-Americans, it's the same thing, very similar. Any, any colonialized people has to survive the trauma and destructive effects of those activities, but they've been going on for so long. There have been waves of migration and change for, you know, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're kind of a resilient species. Yeah, so, so I want to get your perspective on this. So, you know, I sometimes think about this as uh, <laughs> a hardware and software effect. So if, if the uh, American Indians were, they didn't have any contact with the Euro Europeans, let's say, as a thought experiment. Their environment, their food habits, all were sort of optimized for known conditions at that time. Yes. yes. And then you introduce sort of a perturbation into it. Mm -hmm. um, your food habits change. For example, American Indians uh, today have a very high level of metabolic diseases like uh, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Their, their food habits change uh, quite a bit. And so it's a perturbation yes. by external contact that, mm -hmm. that really changed them, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, it's going on, isn't it? I mean, maybe micro doses is going on all around the world. Well, you know, it's never been s static. I'm sure Native American peoples, um, indigenous peoples, changed their diet, for instance, when they came out of East Asia into North America, they encountered some of the same food sources, but also different ones. And so they adapted to that um, and it kept on adapting wherever they moved or settled. So it wasn't static in in any case um, in the macro picture, and it's not now. Lots of Indian people in th this country are trying to recover their traditional foods and start farming them again and using them again to help recover from some of the terrible effects of the nutrition they've been having forced on them by the U.S. government in many cases. Uh, and other Americans are suffering similar kinds of uh, metabolic problems because of eating bad food. And some people eat, try to eat organic food, but there's industrial agriculture pushing back. And um, I don't know where we're headed, but we're headed into a food crisis, I think, because of certainly the, the present situation with the Ukraine and Russia, but in the longer term, because of climate change, some crops aren't doing well in particular places. For instance, uh, Bangladesh, and at the it's the mouth of the Ganges, isn't it? Where there are the uh, Sundarbans and so on, and the salt is encroaching into the fields and uh, they're having to try different kinds of rice that are more tolerant of it and so on. So these kinds of changes are going to become, I think, more pressing. Yeah, they say that they measured 67 degrees Celsius on the surface <laughs> in India recently, uh, which is, awesome. is quite interesting. 
But I want to get your perspective on this. So there's a natural tension here, Molly. You know, um, so you know, on, on one hand, uh, I could argue you got eight billion people. There are not che- there are not differences among them. Let's get them all together. I I, uh, I I'm a globalist. Um, I, I I see no difference between countries, religions, peoples, languages. Anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Now there's a downside to that argument. Uh, if populations, let's say Australian Aborigines or the Brazilian indigenous people right. are micro-optimized for the environment, then globalization has a downside, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Definitely. Mm-hmm. So what's the solution here? I mean, from a modern context, we're sitting in 2022 now, given initial conditions. Oh, I'm certain that I have the exact solution. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's such a complicated picture. I think that that things have to be, let's say, solutions have to be discovered and attempted in particular environments with particular groups of people, because we may all be human beings with the same, almost the same DNA, no matter our languages or religions or cultures, but we don't all live in the same life world. Exactly. The same Umwelt, as Jakob von Uxgall would call it. Um, And so, you know, for me, living in the Pacific Northwest, where it is quite damp on my side of Oregon, at least so far, we're having more drought, but, uh, (laughs) you know, it doesn't, I try to grow vegetables in my garden, but I don't have much luck because I live in the forest Mm. and there's not enough light. We planted apple trees, they won't produce any fruit because there's not enough light. So, you know, for uh, somebody to decide that apples were going to be the solution to a fruit problem worldwide is ridiculous. I mean, apples have traveled a long way from Kazakhstan or wherever they started, but they can't grow in the Sonoran Desert. So I think local solutions are going to have to be developed for a lot of these problems. They can be shared across boundaries uh, to geologically similar areas. Um, but those are some of the constraints. Yeah, I never really deeply thought about this, Molly. So it's sort of, there is a local optimization going on in micro environments that cannot be really be imposed by global rules. No, it that's right. It will be suboptimum, right? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I spent some time in Corvallis. I always felt you got too many trees. You had to cut down some of those trees to get the sunlight. <laughs> a friend of mine from Utah said it was a green hell <laughs> up here. <laughs> He's back in Utah and very happy there. <laughs> but in South India, there are a lot of trees, aren't there? Well, South, uh, Southwest India, anyway. Kerala, is that where that is? Yeah, so I grew up in Kerala. So Kerala still has a lot of trees. Yeah. Um, and when I go there, I get terrible allergies. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> even though I grew up there, it, 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 so yeah, this is another sort of an interesting phenomenon. So I spent half my life there and half my life in the U.S. Uh-huh. I am well tuned to the U.S. environment. I have great difficulty going back. That's interesting. Uh, from a you know purely from a physical perspective, right? Uh, so you he, adapted to this place. Adapted to this place. I, I came from South India to Chicago, and uh, within a couple of months, I was fully <laughs> fully adapted. Really? You're a quick study. <laughs> <laughs> but going back is difficult. I mean, my parents still live back there, and so going back is really difficult. On the other hand, Molly, this is also, I mean, this might be an odd phenomenon. My, my daughter born here and brought up here has no difficulty with the heat and humidity or really? all that stuff. Um, So that goes to sort of an individualistic design aspect, right? Uh, As you say, your environment, your food habits, all of those sort of built into it, I would think. Well, I grew up in Florida. And so, and I can't stand it there anymore for the similar reason to your problem. It's too humid and hot. And I was delighted to get out of there. And I love (laughs) the climate here. But, you know, the food that we had when I was growing up, some of it came from Africa. And we didn't know that. We thought it was local 
it was local traditional food, but it didn't go back very far. Um, right. It's so complicated. I can't get the right kind of cornmeal here. I have to order it from Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, so that's a huge policy question here. Uh, everybody is living in an island, so to speak. Yes. Uh, but the islands are all in a sort of a macro structure. <laughs> and so the question is, how do we keep the islands, but then how do we sort of integrate those islands, right? That's a policy question. Well, you're way beyond me because I've never been much involved with policy. And I don't, I, you know, I share many of, uh, of your globalist views, but at the same time, I don't know who would run such a, a system if it were really global. And we've seen some of the drawbacks recently of some of global um, industrial arrangements and business arrangements and so on. I think you have to do both local things and broader cooperative things with other regions, but I don't know how it's going to happen. And I think we're in a this is not a radical thing to say, a period of great instability and change. I have no idea where we're headed. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it seems to me that Homo sapiens are parochial and localized. And right from our beginning, you know, there's this Dunbar number, as you know, you know, when, when a society, when a clan got about 150, they start to fight, they split, they went on different directions. So there is an inherent limitation. Is this Robin Dunbar? Yeah, yeah. Anthropologist, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it appears to me that there's an inherent limitation to homo sapien collaboration, that they're okay with, you know, yeah. 100, 200 people, but beyond that, you know, things sort of break down. Mm -hmm. I guess that's why we have wars. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, We've had a fairly stable time for the last 60 or 70 years in Europe and this part of the world, but. Yeah, we have wars between countries, we have wars between religions, we have wars between country clubs, um, we have wars with everybody. <laughs> no. But then there's also a lot of cooperation. There is a lot of cooperation too, yeah. It's an enigma. It is. Well, you know who Franz de Waal is? He's I don't know. A primatologist at Emory University. And he has studied chimpanzees, especially, but also bonobos and some uh, other gibbons and other creatures. Uh, and his great contribution was to wake people up in his scientific community to the positive qualities of social life among those. Creatures. Of course, Jane Goodall did it too, but he's continued that kind of work and he shows that they they fight, but they also uh, make up after fights. They comfort each other. They help mm. each other. There's empathy. There, it's so complicated and it, it's true for us too. I think we have these, these uh, conflicting impulses and you can't tell when one of them is going to break out necessarily, except for that that Dunbar equation, you probably remember that Goodall found that when her chimpanzee troop got too large, a group split off and went off to a nearby place. Yeah. And w at one point, the one that they had moved from decided somehow went on a rampage and killed them all, their mm -hmm. relatives, killed them all. Bonobos seem to be uh, friendlier and less violent, but we are we are relatives to both of them, but not so direct. Sometimes when I see some things that certain people do, I say, well, it's mad chimps again. <laughs> you know, January 6th, for instance. Yeah, I mean, the brain is a, is, it's a complex organ that's sort of balanced on a knife edge. Yes. Uh, you know, people say it's a quantum computer and all of that. We have no evidence for any of that. But it's, it's really very unstable organ uh it can go off kilter very very quickly <laughs> but some of those yes. impulses have been useful in the past you know um there's a a celtic an Ir an old irish hero named cahoolan who was a great warrior 
And he was known to go into what they call a warp spasm all of a sudden in a dangerous situation where one of his eyes would pop out and the other one would go in and he would just turn into this huge monster and wreak havoc all around him. Well, the Celts scared the Roman armies that way. They would come rushing at them, nude, covered with blue paint and their hair sticking out, uh, and they'd often be drunk. And this was so crazy compared to the Roman marching and, you know, mm-hmm. neat order and so on, that for a while it was an effective uh, way of countering the Romans. It didn't last, however. But, I mean, some of those impulses seem to come into play when people are at war. Perhaps men particularly, because they're the ones who tend to be in the army. <laughs> yeah, I always say, eliminate men. We will solve half the problems, at least. Uh, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to go into another paper, Human-Animal Relations in Neolithic and Tolian Art, the third page of the book. So before we go there, I want to talk a little bit about, I saw, uh, I think, a video that you talked about Australian Kelpies um, <laughs> uh, 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 herding sheep with Australian Kelpies, a good way yeah. to learn, develop cross-species communication. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, um, we've always had dogs. I'm very interested in other animals. And uh, we went to a, a dog rescue place and brought home one that we thought was a a mixture, um, an animal with pointy ears. And uh, she was black and, I mean, she was uh, cinnamon colored and tan with a very pointy face. And uh, we didn't know that she was a Kelpie, but later we found out that she was, and she was tremendously intelligent and we loved the breed. And so we wanted to continue having those dogs. And the long and the short of it is, after this dog, Alice, we got one who was terrible. And I was trying to figure out how to deal with her and was texting people in Australia about the breed. And this woman said, she needs to work stock. You've got to have her working stock. So I found people who could help me learn to try to teach her this. And it turned out she wasn't very good. Mm. But uh, We went to a clinic to try to get more help, and the man who had come over from Australia had brought four puppies, and I ended up bringing one home who turned into a wonderful, wonderful teammate herding companion, and I I spent about a decade working with him. He only Mm -hmm. died in February, Um, but uh, that's what I was talking about, and I learned so much about communicating with dogs and you have to work with the sheep, too, because they're reading the dog and they're reading you and they're all everyone is trying to figure each other out so that we could cooperate. Of course, it is a form of predation that that we have shaped for these purposes. But um, I don't know if you can see this. Well, no, I have a picture of my dog on my phone. Um, it's he's there. It's a kind of collie, but they don't have long hair hmm. and they they're just very intelligent and uh, makes you respect dogs and their abilities a great deal. So you have sheep in Oregon? Oh yes, there are sheep in Oregon. I don't have them. I go to a farm that's about 20 miles away and this person raises border collies and trains them and uh, gives lessons to people. And I've been going there for about a decade working with her and her sheep. So it's an odd thing you don't usually find among English professors, but it's been very interesting. Yeah. So in this paper, uh, you say traditionally it has been assumed that Neolithic settlements and buildings followed a a gradual control of animals and plants that created food surpluses. But the latest findings have turned that supposition on its head. So what do you mean? Well, uh Archaeology in that area, in in uh, Turkey and in the Fertile Crescent area of Mesopotamia, is increasingly finding that buildings preceded domestication of plants and animals in many cases. There was a culture in uh, the Levant, in pe- what is now Lebanon and Palestine, uh, called Natufian, where the people would sometimes settle in a place for a while, but they were mainly hunters and gatherers. 
and they would gather extra grains, wild grains, and sometimes save them. Um, and then gradually uh, they began to stay put longer and longer. But what, what has changed the uh, overall view of this particularly is the finding that in the, the, the site of Jericho, there's a very old uh, village that they have uncovered and at around the same time, uh, in southern to southeastern Turkey, in Anatolia, they have found uh, this place called Gobekli Tepe, where mm. there was monumental architecture. And there are an, another site or two nearby. Klaus Schmidt, a German archaeologist, uh, excavated this place. And he thought that it was open to the sky and that it was a kind of temple. And it was that they found the, the bones of animals that were eaten there. There, are, there was no sign of any domestic architecture. So this was some kind of a cult building, he thought. Mm. And it, was predated, it predated the domestication of animals and plants. Mm. So that's why they began to think that uh, the, the buildings did not come after the domestication or at the same time. The town of Chatalhuyuk, which is several thousand years later, and let's see, it is, I believe, up to the west of, of Gobekli Tepe uh, in Turkey. That town could hold, you know, up to a thousand people or more, mm. maybe 1,500. I, I can't remember the exact number. <laughs> right now, and it lasted for 1,500 or 2,000 years. It was built in a way similar to the American uh, pueblos of the native people, with entries from the roof built out of a kind of wattle and daub, um, mud and sticks and so on. <clears throat> and they had fire and they had uh, woven cloths. There was a town where people lived together for a long time and all the buildings were contiguous and they would build when a building was collapsing, they'd knock it down and fill in the whole area and then build another one right on top of it with the same configuration and the same walls and so on. So there's a kind of a sedimented material memor memory of, of space there. Hmm. That's what Ian Hodder, an archeologist at Stanford argues about it. Um, but at the lowest levels of those buildings, the earliest ones, there are no domesticated grains and there's not a sign of domesticated animals. But as you move up, you start to see those things happening. And that's what that's what has changed the way people look at this. It's really fascinating and, and counterintuitive to some extent. Yes. So, so architecture, architect, was the uh, oldest profession, <laughs> Homo sapien. The architect happened before the agriculturalist or yes. the farmer, uh, so to speak, right? Yes. Yes, although the earliest architecture wasn't uh, made, wasn't created for permanent sedentary living. Some of the caves uh, in the south of France uh, it turns out were not lived in all the time, mm. and they have found some archaeologists from Berkeley, Meg Conkey, for instance, and some other colleagues have found that there were semi, well, there were buildings between some of those cave sites where people lived part of the time also. And uh, so it's a much more complicated picture now. You didn't but have summer homes. What? Could have been summer homes, like in Florida. That's right. That's right. Yes, perhaps so. <laughs> and the, the thing is, these people moved all the time. They moved. They would stay in a per certain place while the, the herds they were hunting uh, were there, or while certain plants were uh, flowering or seeding um, for seasonal purposes. And then they would move on when the season changed. So... Uh, this kind of thing happened even as far back as, I think, 37,000 B.C. in uh, what is now, I guess, Russia, in, the, in Eastern Europe. 
they have found re remains of tents that were made of mammoth bones or they were structured with mammoth bones and then hides on top of them that these people who were the same uh you know contemporary with the cave people who were making those magnificent paintings in the south of france these people didn't have any caves so they built their own in effect with what they had around and they had elaborate clothing and shell jewelry and all those kinds of things have been found uh, by archaeologists in uh, eastern europe or eastern eurasia so it's a complicated picture it's a complicated picture you know, in some sense culture rose and then we found agriculture and both culture and our health declined <laughs> That's right. So, That's right. The last 5,000 years, they've been going downhill. Except that it. people have lived longer since the development of, of these, of, of agriculture and um, more stable food sources. Some of those, those so-called cave people in the Paleolithic era were extremely hardy, but they didn't live very long. Hmm. It's a tough life. It was a tough life. Yeah. Oh, a very tough life, yes. So life got softer and easier once you had settled um, habitations and agriculture and animals that you had control over and could eat when you wanted to. But at the same time, living so close meant a lot of health hazards. And Do you think, uh, I don't know anything about this, Marty, but do you think, so 5,000 years, uh, advent of agriculture, mass production, mass distribution, mass consumption. Do you think culture is declining? Uh, do you think Homo sapiens were much more sophisticated 5,000 years ago? No. Okay. <laughs> I think that they were as sophisticated, but in different ways. I think, I think much more of their culture was uh, with them all the time. It wasn't externalized and written down. I mean, some of it was painted on the walls of caves or formed into objects, but but it was passed on from person to person and practice in dynamic time. It was very sophisticated, though, and it was completely inter intermeshed with the environment around it in ways that ours is not. We have forgotten how to be totally closely attentive to the changing seasons and the other creatures and the you know plants around us whereas the cultures of five years five thousand years ago was much more fully engaged with all those things in sophisticated ways i mean they even say that some farmers in peru five ten thousand years ago could look into the sky the night sky and tell what kind of weather would be coming uh, in in you know months and months away because of configuration of stars or something like that? The light, I don't understand it, but I mean that's the kind of attunement that some of those people had. Yeah, I'm thinking you know so art and art and architecture five thousand years ago seemed like they were fairly high, fairly well advanced, and I look at contemporary world and I see 8 billion people, maybe 7 billion are struggling to, to get sufficient resources. Yes. So art and architecture have become more of a luxury item yes. for, for a few in mm -hmm. the modern context, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that might have been different 5,000 years ago, I wonder. Oh, I think so. But I think even 5,000 years ago, there were the few who had the comforts in places like Uruk, where the first epic was produced, the Epic of Gilgamesh, for instance. Um, most of the people did not live in that city. The city was pretty large, mm -hmm. but the surrounding countryside was much, much, much more extensive. And the people who lived out there didn't have the advantages of the city. Mm -hmm. So that was 5,000 years ago. That was one place, not everywhere, not, you know, in, in Italy 5,000 years ago, there was no, no huge city <laughs> or nowhere in the British Isles, nowhere, I don't know about India, but uh, in this country, in this 
hemisphere. Let's see. Well, the Mayans did pretty well, maybe not quite 5,000 years ago, but close. But they too were an elite, they had an elite society. And most of the people who lived there were not members of it. Yes, yeah, so it was a unique, some unique instances that we are observing. Yes. Clearly cannot generalize that across populations, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I want to finish up with another paper. Um, uh, Murdu Ponty, uh, I don't know if I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly, Molly, and the Eco Literary Imaginary. Yes. <laughs> well, I made that up, and so people might think it's ridiculous. It may not catch fire. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I found it very interesting. So, Murdu Ponty considered, you say, the imaginary to be a fundamental dimension yes. of real. Indeed, the very foundation of institution of being. Works of art and literature, as well as dreams, nightmares, fantasies, and idealizations bring this invisible realm into visibility. Um, you go on, you say, from the time of our most ancient Homo sapien ancestors, painted and carved images and words have recorded ecological understandings and experiences in forms that speak to us mysteriously even nightmarishly as cultural memories. Um, humans have been pretty good at this, right? We have been storytellers, we have been image makers, even before that bend of cameras and That's video right. recorders. Uh, we can sort of do thought experiments, um, think about things in our head. So humans are pretty good at this, but it is, I wonder if it also has a little bit of a downside. Uh, let, let me put this to you, and, and I, I don't believe in this. <laughs> uh, so if, if the objective function of a homo sapien is fairly straightforward, you know, uh, spread his, his or her genes, get enough food, live, then all these things appear to be somewhat noise. I mean, why should a homo sapien be engaged in art and the imaginary? because we've never been objective creatures. <laughs> yes. We're always storytellers. Scientists are storytellers. They can't explain, you know, the subatomic realm without metaphors. The imaginary is an absolutely necessary dimension of our existence. And to me, the invention of logic and uh, positivistic thinking is quite recent. And it is a reduction of our experience and our mental lives. It has great powers, but it's only part of the whole experience and our, our knowledge and understanding. Art is absolutely necessary to us, I believe. I believe the spiritual realm, whether you're religious or not, is deeply, deeply centralized in art, literature, and music, and it is necessary to all of us. It is our cultural inheritance. It is the sedimentation of thousands and thousands of years of feeling and expression. And so, for me, that is tremendously important. Yeah, so I want to get your perspective on this. You know, I, so early 1900s, uh, Einstein was an artist. He wasn't really a mathematician. He had to imagine That's right. things. Yes. And we have made things, as you say, very reductionist, very prescriptive, very mathematical. So today we sit in, you know, things like string theory, quantum mechanics. There is a lot of scope for imagination. <laughs> there. Well, doesn't there have to be in order to even imagine a string? The, the problem is, um, it appears to me, I don't know much about this, it appears to me we are sort of trending into an area where you can't solve problems by imagination anymore. And if that were true, I think it would destroy, destroy the human, because as you say, humans are fundamentally about imagination, not about mathematics. That's right. Yes. Our sciences are becoming very, very prescriptive, very mathematical. And so we have to either change us 
into less imaginative, or we have to leave those fields and go somewhere else. <laughs> and it seems like sort of a binary outcome in some way. Well, you know much more about it than I do. I'm not very deeply involved in science. I mean, some kinds of science, but many scientists, I'm sure physicists would say that archaeology is not a science, you know, <laughs> the kind of history, uh, that sort of thing. I just don't know. I mean, can you imagine AI becoming who we are? I don't, I can't go there. <laughs> I mean, really, I think no matter how clever the computers are, I don't think they will ever come up with the kind of imaginative actions that we have. Now, our species always changes and may change in some unimaginable way, or we may be wiped out. I'm not too sanguine about the future, frankly, given how little effort there has been made to serious, serious effort to change the way we live before the, the climate heats up too much. I just don't see it. There are so many forces countering the efforts. So, but but yeah. if we do survive, some of us, <laughs> I can't imagine that we would be, you know, where would we be living if we didn't didn't use our full range of intellectual activities? If we only did some kind of mathematics, we would we be building houses just by making mathematical formulas, algorithms? I don't know. I, I'm, you know, I feel that I'm getting left behind. And of course, I'm not young. So I will be left behind. But uh, my mind cannot fathom where we're headed. Yeah, the AI question is a, is a real question. So um, there's last week, somebody, uh, you know, a company that the search company Google has bought said the game is over. It's just a scale up problem. The, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Fine. And, and most problems are scalar problems, you know. Uh, yeah. We, we can solve, we can make little toys, and then we try to scale it up. Things don't quite work. Um, I think so. Yeah, I'm not convinced. Of yeah. arrogance. I just really <laughs> do. Oh, we can fix it. We can do it all. Sure. Yeah, but, but it's a real issue that this loss of imagination are we are we going to change ourselves into a different species who are, who are very very prescriptive not a lot of uncertainty in our lives uh, we know precisely how long we're going to live we know precisely what medications to take what schools to go to to get educated what education to do all of those are sort of set it's like automaton, so it's like robots. So a kid is born, the kid is an automaton with her path completely prescribed by her parents, you know, uh, her teachers, and to some extent her government <laughs> in this case. I don't see that happening. Is it happening now? It's happening less now, I would say, for many, many people. Yeah, I'm I'm a bit conflicted about this, Maria. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I mean, look, look to look look to the U.S. See what happened to us last uh, four or five years. I don't think we are in a very comfortable position from no. uh, you know, no speech, speech democracy, you know, those types no. of things. Right? But I also don't see the forces of authority totally controlling us. Now, maybe they will. Maybe we should look to North Korea to see how that works out. I don't know. Or or Saudi Arabia. I mean, there are countries where there are very strong authoritarian forces trying to prescribe everything. But I don't think it will work. Yeah, it hasn't worked, but that hasn't really prevented uh, modern democracies um, trying it. U.S. is one example. India is another example. There's another experiment going on there. Uh, so this large modern democracies, quote unquote, have tried it and are still trying it. And so I, I'm thinking about the outcomes, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, what do you see ahead for outcomes? 
I'm a bit pessimistic, I have to say. <laughs> um, I see a lot of trends that are that I never thought I would see. Yes. In a, in a modern context, right? That that makes me very afraid. Yes. Yes, I agree. But I came from a part of this country that I didn't understand. I lived in a little comfortable bubble, a little privileged bubble. Not wealthy, but comfortable. And since leaving there, I have learned more about the fuller history of that place and of this country. And some of what is happening now is the unleashing of forces that were very powerful in the South before the Civil War and after the Civil War, and that have had a lot to do with the history of this country. So I don't know. It's not the country I thought it was. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty, I would say. Yes. Um, but I, I really, uh, I understood some of it, Marty, but I really liked your, your essays. And imagination is probably the last thing we want to lose. Um, yes. Because it will change us. If yes. You know oh, yes. I don't think we will lose it. That's comforting. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, this has been great. I've thanks enjoyed so much it very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye.